you are the reason why we have gathered here this morning and may it be true of our hearts this morning in this very moment that you are the reason that we lift our hands and in spite of our circumstances no matter how we have come into this worship house today that we lift our eyes up to you and say Lord we want to see you high and lifted up lifted up because we trust you lifted up because you are holy lifted up because you are sovereign above all. And Lord, we worship you this morning. We cry out to you in this place of saying, Lord, we need you.
and we love you. May you find our worship this morning holy in your ears. And may your name be honored and praised in this house this morning. As we worship you in a place that does not allow for fear. Lord, may we come to you in a place where we ask for freedom and we ask for breakthrough so that we can see you more clearly and welcome your love and welcome your presence. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue in worship this morning. that you can just feel the presence of God here, that he is for you and with you. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy. Till all my fears are gone, I'm no longer a slave to fear. For I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. For I am a child.
Yes, I am a child of God. I'm no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am a child of God. Cause I am a child of God. Amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. Sing it out. God, you're so
Let's be reminded this morning of his power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. Don't sufficient sacrifice so free.
the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. Good morning. If your family is uh, like my family, we have a long way to go. And we just need the power of Jesus working in our lives. So I'm going to ask that you do this. If you just stand for a moment, and we're going to zero in on something. We're going to sing that chorus again. There's power in the name of Jesus. And I want you to pray that over your families. Pray that over your children and your grandchildren and your your marriage. Pray that in Jesus' name. Let's declare it together in Jesus' name, and let's do it together. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. So break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Would you just say amen to that? I mean, we solidify that with an amen. God is good, and He takes care of our families, He takes care of our children, and we give that to Him today. God, we're just so thankful that you watch over us that you pay attention to the details of our lives. And today, we give honor and we give glory to you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray and we say amen again. Amen. God bless you. It is so good to see you today. You may be seated. Worship team, thank you. It's been a, a pleasure to be able to worship with all of you today. Listen. In just a moment, we're going to receive our tithe and our offering. That's what we do around here. We call that worship. And it really has to do with honoring a generous God. Uh, because He's been generous with us, we want to be generous with those around us. And we also want you to be, uh, be connected to us. So if you get a chance, you can fill out this Canby Connect card. You can drop it in the offering basket when it comes around. You can take it out to the desk out front. But... But we just want to stay connected, want to be connected to you and really to community so we can continue to pray. Two weeks from this weekend, we have water baptism. And so I think right now we have 15 or 20 folks signed up for water baptism. And so if you haven't done that yet, this is the big step in our discipleship process. It's water baptism. We believe that with all of our heart. And if you've never been baptized in water, you go ahead and fill that out. We'll have someone contact you and just really walk you through the process of what water baptism is really, really all about. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, and we're going to receive our gifts today. Again, thank you for your generosity. Father, we just thank you today for the, the wonderful ways that you pour out your grace in our lives. And Lord, we're reminded of how you've been generous to us. And so we thank you for everything that you're doing, Lord. We thank you that we're part of community that honors you, that lifts up the name of Jesus in this place, the powerful name of Jesus. And so, Lord, once again, we pray over our families. We pray over our community. We pray over this nation in the powerful name of Jesus, that you would bring restoration and wholeness in our relationship with you and our relationship with others. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. 
Well, welcome. It really is good to see you today. And we're starting a new series. That's what we're going to do. We're going to take the next several weeks and we're going to talk about strengthening our families. And we're going to talk to parents and grandparents and kids. We're going to talk to what it means to ask courageous questions as a single parent. We're going to try to cover as many parts of family as we can. And so I'm excited about this. I've looked forward to this for six months now. And so we're going to do that today. So parents, those that are raising kids, just lift your hands. Let me see. Yeah, those that are raising kids. Good, good. Okay, put your hands down. Now, you, you notice something different here when you ask singles to lift, lift their hand. They, you know, like parents, they kind of go like this. You know, it's just like they're coming in. And right, church can be a place where you kind of take a nap. You know, you get a little break. You rest. I mean, it is, it's tough. What parenting is like, it's, it's when uh, you, you feel like you're drowning and someone throws you four more kids into your whirlpool. You know, it's like, whoa. I mean, it's just, it's tough. It's hard. And I, I really do. Annette and I feel for you. We've had the last six months... We've had our grandkids with us, and, and uh, we got a close and up personal look, up close and personal look at what it is again. And I, I'd go to bed at like 7 at night, you know. I'm just, I'm tired, man. I'm thinking, wow, no wonder they, they let you be parents when you're younger because grandparents are just pooped out by 7 or 8 o'clock. And so we've gotten to see that happen, and, and it just reminds us, it reminds me uh, of the power of family. It reminds me of what it means uh, to be submitted to Jesus Christ, to follow Him. So here's what we're going to do for the next few weeks. We're going to talk today about strengthening your family. I'm going to begin a, a, a little brief series in the series called The Seven Essentials of Developing a Family that Follows Jesus. And I just think we need to talk about that, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I I hope you see kind of the way this is all working. The last two weeks, we talked about discipleship here in this place. Now we're going to talk about discipleship in our families. What does that look like? So I'm going to start that with the three essentials today. Next week, Pastor Mark's going to be sharing. uh, And the reason that's happening, and so just, uh, just want you to know, Annette and I are headed down to watch two Dodger games next weekend. So just letting you know, we got a little break. Uh, Mark's going to cover for us. He's going to talk about family. And then when we come back, we're going to finish the seven essentials by talking about the last four essentials of raising or developing a family that follows Jesus Christ. So this is what we're going to do. We are just wanting to follow Jesus because we need families that, that raise the banner of Jesus Christ. It's a subject that's been really on my heart for several months now. And because, sadly, it is possible to have two Christian parents over a home, but it's not really a home that follows Jesus. Because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to have a Christian home. Now listen, I'm not talking about a perfect home. None of us are in a perfect home. None of us are part of a perfect home. You're not raising a perfect home. There is your home in the real world. That's the home that we're talking about. We're talking about engaging with the power of Jesus. We're talking about engaging with God's Word and His Holy Spirit to really raise us up, to allow us to be stronger than we were before. What God desires for us is to develop a home that follows Jesus. And the scripture that comes to my mind, I think, about homes and families following Jesus, one, uh, one scripture that my, my mom and dad used to have on their front porch was actually engraved in a rock on their front porch. All the neighbors could see it. And the scripture was Joshua twenty four fifteen. Some of you might be familiar with that. I want to read it to you. It says this, But if serving the Lord, this is Joshua talking to the children of Israel, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, Then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me, this is Joshua speaking, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Do you hear that declaration? That's really what we're praying for. That's really what I want to have sink into our lives is that we would make that decision If you haven't made that, we would make the decision and even re-up in that decision that we're in the army of God, that that we're part of his family and that we choose to serve him. So what are these seven essentials? Well, number one is this. Number one will not be surprising to you. Jesus must be first. Write that down. Jesus must be first. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, And all these things will be given to you as well. 
See, the reality that we face today is that, that, that it's a fight for first. That, that there's always a struggle, there's a battle, there's a fight for first in everything. Now, if you don't believe me, go out today and head to the Fred Meyer parking lot and see how many people fight for those upfront places. You know what I'm talking about? For the best parking places. I mean, people want to be first. They want to be first in line. They want to be first in the parking, the best parking. You see that. It's kind of the way we are. And I'm going to confess something, and some of you know this. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty laid back most of the time, but when we go to airports, and that has to really calm me down, they call me Airport Ron. And, and the reason that happens is something takes over right when I walk through the doors, and I'm saying, come on, let's go. We've got to be first in line. We've got to be first to get our tickets. We need to be first through security. And I'm, it's a quest for me. And I think I, I'm getting a little better. Uh, after a a little therapy and all those kind of things, I think I'm a little better with going into the airport. But I want to be first. The other day, Annette doesn't even know this. It's horrible to admit. But, you know, we have Chick-fil-A out here every Thursday, and and we were headed home. And she goes, oh, there's Chick-fil-A. Let's go get Chick-fil-A. So we went over there, and I looked around, and there were people making their way to the Chick-fil-A truck. And I said, hurry, give me the money. Come on, come on, come on. And she got her money out, gave it to me, and I got first in line. You know, and I thought, wow, Ron, you need to you need to back away. You know, it's just something. There's always this fight that we want to be first in line. No one wants to be the end of the line. Everybody wants to be at first in line. If you ever watch smart teachers work with kids, you know what they do? They don't just say, hey, everybody, come on up here. You know what they say? Get behind Ron. Make a line behind Ron. Yeah, they're smart because there's the beginning. There's the first. People can identify that and they file in. They choose someone to be first and then everything else just seems to fall in place. Well, Jesus says exactly that. He says the same thing. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and then all of these other things will fall in place for your life. That what is the priority? The priority of a family is that we seek first the kingdom of God and everything else falls in place. The Old Testament version of Matthew 6.23 or 6.33 is Exodus 20, verse 3. It's the first commandment. What does it say? It says, you shall have no other gods before me. See, God is jealous for our relationship with him. He's jealous that we put him first in the relationship and in our families. God says, I want to be first, but he also knows this. There's a fight for first place. When you go through the rest of the commandments, you see where that struggle can happen. You can see the context of of how life can be lived out. And there's always a struggle. There's always a fight for first. Jesus wants to get to the heart of the matter. Literally. Jesus wants to get to the throne of your affection. And there's a reason for this. The truth is we become what we love. Jesus addresses that. We are what we love. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. You see, God says, If you love me, then you will truly follow me. Isn't that true? That we'll follow what we love and who we love. So God is saying to us, Listen, listen, put me first. Put me first in your your thought life. Put me first in your emotional life, your spiritual life. Put me first, and all these other things will will fall into place. What we, I know, what I, and what you must be renewed in. I think the thing that we really need to remember is is that we are made in the image of God. The word, uh, the, the Greek word is imago Dei. We are worshipers. And if we don't worship God, guess what? You will worship something. You will worship something. You've been wired to be a worshiper. You've been created by God to be a worshiper. And so that's why we come together like we do on Sunday morning and other parts of the week where we get together and we just say, hey, we're going to set some time aside and we're just going to worship Him. We're going to worship Him with our song. We're going to worship Him with our giving. We're going to worship Him with the Word. We're going to worship Him because if we don't worship Him, we will worship something else. That, that's really the, the nature of how we've been put together. Uh, I think what we have to think about and identify in our lives is what is that something else? You know, what is that something else in your life right now? Uh, could it be just our things? Maybe, maybe it's our safety because that, that's a big deal today. Our comfort. Our children. 
What are the things that we put first before we put before God? So what determines first? It's the thing or things that you love. Again, we become what we love. So I want you to listen how John puts it in 1 John, the first epistle of John, uh, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, uh, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God, what happens? They live forever. So let me put it this way. John says, you're supposed to put Jesus first, but you're having an affair with the world. Do you remember what Elijah said? He said to the people almost the same thing that Joshua said. He says, why do you keep jumping back and forth between God and other gods? Why do you do that? And the reason is, is the children of Israel, unlike, or a lot like us, uh, they, we want both. So what John is saying is, listen, you can't have both. We are so immersed at times in the world, we might not even know the difference between the kingdom of God and the world we live in. You see, I I think that's probably one of the things that that we need to pay attention to today. What world do we belong to? Are we part of God's kingdom world? Are we part of the world world that we're we're in right now? And I think it's good for us to step back, and, and maybe today we get to do that just a little bit. Step back and say, Lord, in my heart, where... Where am I immersed in the world so much that I don't even, I don't even know. I can't even distinguish the difference between living in the world and living in your kingdom. So here's my concern. I think it's possible in our Western version of Christianity, we've become detached from what it means to really be a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's possible that we can have just enough religion to inoculate us from the real thing. Jesus says he must be first. There's no other gods we put before him. Parents, if you have a half-hearted relationship with Jesus Christ, if, if you're half-hearted about following Jesus, your kids will be quarter-hearted in following Jesus. I think that's something we, we want to pray over. That's something that in this room we want to get straight. We want to have our, our, our priorities lined up. We want to seek first the kingdom of God. Parents, I I think we can make ourselves believe that if we bring our kids to church every now and again, then maybe a little Jesus is going to rub off on them. That's not the way this works. Seek first the kingdom of God. Don't put any other gods before you. Jesus isn't about just rubbing off. Jesus is about taking control of our hearts, that he has the throne of our heart. That he has our affections. He has everything about us. Remember, you're the model, parents, grandparents. You're the model in your home. It isn't the responsibility of everyone else. It's our responsibility as parents and grandparents to follow Jesus, to put him first so our kids can see what's going on in our lives. Parents, is Jesus first? That's the question. That's really the best way to start this series on family. When we talk about discipleship, when we talk about family that's following Jesus, is Jesus first? Is he first in life? Is he first in relationship? Is he first in your finances? Is he first? Because I can say this, your kids and grandkids have a nose to sniff out what's not first. They do. They have an eye to see those things. They might tell you in different ways. I know my kids found creative ways to let Annette and I know, and it really kind of put our priorities back in order. When we'd hear them say certain things, we'd think, oh, wow, we need to get that one together. It was almost like a prophetic word coming from a four-year-old, you know. And we really paid attention to that. We really wanted to dialogue with our kids to see what was happening in their life. So here's the reminder I want to give you, because when we look forward into this series We're going to finish it on Wednesday evening, October 23rd, in this place. And we are going to pray over our families and kids. And that is how we're going to put an exclamation mark on the Family Life series. We we, we need to get together. We need to pray over them in the name of Jesus. We need to uh, anoint this place, anoint our homes, go through our schools, round our city, and just pray in Jesus' name, let your kingdom come, thy will be done, here where we're at right now. 
Lord, make your gospel real to us. Make your gospel real to our children so that we're raising up followers of Jesus Christ. I think most of you know if you've been around here for a while, I have a passion for this. I have a passion for the next generation. And I don't want to take my eye off that ball, metaphorically speaking. I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to look to the right or to the left. I want to stay focused in what Jesus is up to in the lives of our children, what he's up to in the lives of our family. So here is the second essential for a family that follows Jesus Christ. It's not only putting Jesus first, but it's about creating an atmosphere of grace. Creating an atmosphere of grace in your home. Let grace abound in your home. I really like this scripture. It's a little obscure, but it really reminds me of where grace begins in our homes. The fountainhead of grace is uh, between a husband and wife. Moms, if you're leading a home right now and you're a single mom, it's with you. Dads, if you're a single dad and you're leading a home, you set the temperature, the atmosphere. Does that make sense? So so I might be the one in my home as a father that I oversee the thermostat, but Annette's the one that tells me if it's too warm or too cold. See, there's a partnership in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9a. It says, enjoy the life with your wife or your spouse whom you love. Isn't that just simple? What it's saying here is bring grace in your relationship with each other and grace will abound in your home. I I really like this verse. Enjoy life with your spouse whom you love. Parents, your love and your enjoyment of each other creates a safe place. A safe place for grace. And I'm going to say this. I don't say this very often, but Annette is the love of my life. Absolutely. She is the wife of my youth. And that's the commitment we've had for 41 years. She's had to put up with a whole lot of things with me. But we work together. And I'm so glad that I have the wife of my youth. That I'm in love. And every day, I recognize that my kids know it. My grandkids know it. They come into our house and they see it. They feel it. There's an atmosphere of grace that's created when there's love in that home between mom and dad. Let them feel that. Let them experience that. Did you know that your kids are always asking questions about you? I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put aside the verbal questions because there's enough of those. I mean, I just remember spent six months with my grandkids and I would start to give one answer based on a question they asked me and I couldn't even get it out before another question came and I couldn't get it out and another question came. It was like rapid fire. I'm not used to that, man. It just was like coming at me. But there's some important questions that your kids ask about you that they don't even verbalize. They're observing, they're watching, they're paying attention, but they're nonverbal questions. So over the years, this is what I've discovered as a parent and as someone who is extremely passionate for our young generation. And it's this, and this is what you have to commit yourself to. So I'm going to ask all of you to make a commitment right now with me. The way that we understand these nonverbal questions is when we become students of our students. Now, I want to say that again. You must become a student of your children. It's up to you to understand their behaviors. It's up to you to know their weaknesses and strengths. It's up to you to know their gifts, their passions. So I know for me and for Annette, we've made it a thing to become students of our students, our children. And we watch them. And in that, you're able to give the direction, I think, that's needed. So commit today, parents, to be students of your students. And when you do that, I think God's going to show you a whole lot. So here's what happens when you become students of your students. There are three questions that every child needs their parents to answer. Number one question. Number one above everything else. Who's in charge? That's the question. You can write it down. Who's in charge? They always want to know. You know, we're born to have someone in charge of us. (laughs) There's there's protection, there's safety, there's covering in that. But the first question they'll always ask, every child needs to know the answer. Every child will question their parents' God-given authority, some more than others. 
that I have a few of those sums in my house. This is why our children need their parents to establish boundaries, spiritual covering. So parents, remember that every time, it's just not answering at once, it's answering at multiple times over the course of a day. You know, this is amazing. You see a four-year-old leave the room, they're gone for 10 minutes, they come back, they want that question answered again. Am I in charge or are you still in charge? See, see if I'm wrong, just don't say anything and see who takes charge. It's going to be the four-year-old. So they want to know who's in charge. Now, parents, please listen to me here. The authenticity of your authority, your God-given authority, really depends on one thing. One thing only, and that's this. Are you under authority? This, This doesn't work. This doesn't work. If you're not a person under authority, if you're not submitted to authority in your life, do you complain about your boss all the time? Do you complain about the governmental officials all the time? Listen, I'm telling you something. Some of the rhetoric that goes on about politics today is not healthy for your kids because they're hearing you talk about them in an unhealthy way. You know what they're saying? They're thinking, oh, they're not submitted. Listen, for our children to follow us, to be submitted to us, to understand godly authority in our lives, we must be submitted people. I want to be submitted to God. I I, I submit in my home out of reverence for each other. I I submit to uh, 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 the elders and the council. And and I I I have a lot of different places that I take seriously about submitting because I know this, it's a dangerous place to be if you're not submitted. What it means is you then become the authority. You then become the smartest person in the room. And that is absolutely dangerous. See, I I, want to live, I really do, I want to live a submitted life. And if you're not submitted, those kids see it. And in the eyes of your children, if you're not submitted, to them it's a double standard. They can see the lack of authenticity. Jesus had authority because he was under authority. Do you see this? Jesus had authority because he was someone under authority. What did he say? Not my will be done, but the will of my Father who I'm submitted to. So I would say this, if the Son of God is submitted and understands the value of that, the power of that, then it's probably good we would understand that. Here it is. Keep a balance between authority and affection in your home. Keep a balance between authority and affection in your home. There really is a balance. I don't think anyone has to be a tyrant to have authority. In fact, I've always believed this. If you're the sheriff in town and you have to pull out your gun, you're probably not the sheriff in town. You know what I'm saying? If I have to always say you're going to do this because I'm the pastor, I'm probably not the pastor, at least to you. See, there's a reverence that we have for each other. Jesus submitted. Next question your children ask is this. Once established that you're the one in charge, a God-given authority is this question. Which way are we going? Okay, you're in charge. Where are we going? I mean, I'm getting on this bus. I'm on this train. Which way are we going? You, 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 you lead us. Kids are looking for that. They want that kind of direction in their life. This addresses the longing that every child has for direction. Parents, you help establish a child's spiritual compass when you give them direction. And they watch you read God's word. They they listen to your language. They know that you fast, that you pray, that you come into community, a, a faith community. They see all of this. And what you're doing is you're establishing their compass, their spiritual compass. And I'll say this. I do know there's times that kids start to think more on their own. They, they, they do know that, 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 well, now it's my turn. I'm, I'm 18. I mean, they think it's magical, but it scares me. I pray for them. But I'm going to tell you something. If you've set a good compass, they'll come back. They will be grounded. It's our responsibility to do that. It's your responsibility to point your children to Jesus through the guidance of God's Holy Spirit and God's Word. I was convicted the other day. 
uh, uh, with my grandkids around and, and my kids. And I was convicted the other day. I, I read the Bible out of my app. You know, I have it on my iPad. Well, I put it away. I need to read the Bible out of the Bible. Now, I'm not trying to show off, but I want my kids and grandkids to know that I open God's word. I'm the one that establishes legacy. I'm the one that, that again, oversees the thermostat. I want it to be hot for Jesus. And so I put away my iPad, pulled out my Bible. I'm reading the same thing. Parents, open your Bibles. Read your Bible. Leave your Bible open. I think it's an invitation to God's Holy Spirit to invade your house, your home, your relationships. It's also an invitation to your kids to dive in to God's Word. Proverbs 22.6 says this, Train up a child in the way, the direction that he or she should go. Remember, you're pointing them to Jesus. Constantly pointing them to Jesus. Told this story a long time ago, but it still holds true because I, I have this, this picture and this picture in my mind of what it means to point our children to Jesus. I, I used to play Little League. My dad was the coach. My dad was the third base coach. And every time I got on base, I was always looking. When I was round in second, I was looking at the third base coach. The signal that I love more than anything else was this one. You know, it was like, go home, go home. Listen, our job isn't to get them three quarters of the way there. Our job is to wave them home. Get them home to Jesus. Let them be firmly planted in in faith in Jesus Christ. And then the third question your kids are asking about their parents is, are you going to go with me? All right, you're the one in charge. I'm on your bus. Are you going to go? Are you just going to tell me to go? This has everything to do. Listen, it has everything to do with conviction, determination, resolve. To do what you're asking them to do. It takes action. Not just talk, but it takes action. Parents, don't think that your influence ends when your kids leave the house. Can I tell you the the, the demographic that is, uh, they, they, they know this. The demographic that's leaving the church quicker than even our kids are baby boomers. You know why? All right, done, raise my kids. I'm off. This is study. This is science. Can I say this? Parents that are, have raised your children, your job is not done when they leave. Your job is not over. It changes, but it's not over. So grandparents, this is where you can be incredibly valuable to a home. Because we've lived in a kind of a fragmented, almost transient community more than we've ever lived before. We need grandparents. We need grandparent-like people as well that will be in our homes, that will help us, that will pray for us. We need that. Grandparents, your job is still in front of you. Keep praying. Keep encouraging. You're incredibly valuable to the community of Jesus Christ and to community at large. So answer these questions for your kids. It can be life-changing. And by doing so, you set an atmosphere of grace in your home. Who's in charge? Which way are we going? And are you going with me? And so I'm going to finish today with this. It's the third essential because I'll be doing again the the next four essentials in two weeks. But I I want you to get this. The third essential is clarify your values. Look for different ways to clarify your values according to God's word. God did this for the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. This is called the Shema, the first and the last prayer of every day of the people of Israel. They used to bind them and still do. They're called phylacteries on their head. You've seen the the, the Jewish devout Jews put a box on their head and they put it on their wrist. That is literal. Keep it before you, the Shema. Keep it before you every day, before your head, on your wrist. Bind them on you. It's the Shema. Read it when you get up. Read it before you go to bed at night. And it says this. These are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. 
Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. That's the Shema. And today, it's, it hasn't escaped me that uh, parents in this room, including Annette and I, we look back at times and we think, man, I, re- I, I regret that. There's hard things that I look back at and I think, man, I wish I would have never done that. I wish I would have never said that. There's not a parent or a grandparent in this room that hasn't dealt with regret. But here's the great thing. God's Holy Spirit can come in and take that and make it a lesson for your life and you grow stronger in that when we obey Him, when we obey His commands. Listen, our children are a gift from God. Our grandchildren are a gift from God. Did you know that it costs in the state of Oregon over $200,000 to raise a kid from age 0 to 18? I think my daughter's twice that much. If you've got girls, it might be a little more than that. How do we clarify our values? This is an investment that we're, we're making. How do we clarify our values? By first knowing who and what influences our kids. Who and what is influencing your children, your grandchildren? Who is it? Here are three things, three sources of influence. Let me give you what they are. One is external. Huge pressure. Huge influence is external pressure and influence. It's uh, everyone says. You've heard that. Well, everyone's doing it. Your kids come to you. Can I do this? No. Well, everyone's doing it. So there's an external pressure. You hear that all the time. Parents, you hear that. Ah, mom, ah, dad, everyone's doing it. But our life is a bit different. doesn't mean it's absent of fun. It's just different. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're no longer living the way the world lived. We're living in the kingdom life, God's kingdom. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, His pleasing, and perfect will. I love that. So there's an influence that comes from the outside. There's also internal influences in the culture we live today. It's the voice inside of me that says, my feelings say. I'm going to do this because I just feel like doing it. We become our own experts because my feelings say. We don't defer to God. We don't defer to His Word. We don't submit to that. And Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. He has a higher way for us. He's called us to a higher standard. And then, I love this, there's another influence. It's eternal. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is above me. It is about what God says. It's not about what others say. It's not about what my feelings say. It's about what God says. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, the first part of this says, All Scripture is good and and, 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 uh, God-breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Wow. That's powerful. That is powerful. Parents, let's hold to the Word of God. Let's stand on the Word of God. Let's immerse ourselves in the Word of God. We need to raise the value of God's Word in our lives. Let them see and know the Word of God. And I'm going to finish with this. As parents who follow Jesus, we value the fact that a few things that we really value. Number one is we are creating an eternal soul, aren't we? That we're creating an eternal soul. That that's, we've been given that responsibility to raise a soul that will live forever. That's, that blows my mind. You've heard young couples say this. Oh, we're going to get married and we're going to have a little baby. They never say, oh, we're going to get married and have a little teenager. They don't say that kind of thing. It's like we want a little baby. We want to have little babies that will be teenagers. But right now they're little babies. Say when parents say that and it's their first, I, I know for me I had no idea what was ahead for me. I just remember taking my first out of the hospital and thought, isn't somebody going to come with me and help me with this? I mean, is it? No, no. Uh, you mean I, oh, you know, it hits you right then. You're going, oh, my gosh, I'm in charge. That's scary. That's why I need the Word. That's why I need God's Holy Spirit 
to lead me because I am. You are part. Listen, you are creating an eternal soul. And when we decide to have children, you are partnering with God. Incredible. Here's another thing. Our example is much more important than our opinions. Listen, your kids might not be reading the Bible every day, but they are reading you every day. Here's another one. Our marriage is the foundation of our family. My kids have been raised, and and we, we like to think that we're helping with our grandkids. We do. Uh, the constant, the foundation is Annette and I have been married for 41 years. That, 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 that has some cred, you know, that gets you a little street credibility. I, I felt like a rookie up till about 15 years ago. You know, I was in the rookie leagues for the first 25 or 30 years I was married. I was like, wow. Feeling a little more seniority now. Takes time. There's a lot of time invested. And can I remind you, and I'm going to finish with this. God is the one who defines marriage. You know that, don't you? He defines marriage in Scripture as the joining of a man and a woman. God defines marriage. Not us. Not our government. God does. We need to be very clear about that. God defines our marriages. The best thing, the best gift, parents, that you can give your family, that I can give my family, is that I love my wife like Christ loves the church. Husbands, fathers, the best gift is I lay my life down for my wife. That's the example that's used in Ephesians chapter 5. Next week, Mark's going to talk to us a little more about what it means to be godly men. And it applies to all of us, men and women. So we want to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus, to develop followers of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? I think this is really timely where we're at right now. I think this is very appropriate where we are right now with the fear and the insecurities that are rampant in the world that we're connected to, that we engage with, that we interact with. We need to be the salt, the light. We need to be that foundation that has been given to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you do that? Father, I just pray today that, that um, you would just infuse us with a passion of your Holy Spirit to, to, to dive deeper into your word as parents, as grandparents, as those that are part of, of raising uh, children. Lord, we just pray that we would have a passion for you and we would seek first the kingdom of God before anything else. And when we do that, we know that all these other things will be added unto us. So, Lord, I just pray a a blessing over our homes here today. Pray a blessing over our single moms, our single dads, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our parents. Jesus, in Jesus' name, uh, let strength come. Lord, let every chain be broken, every chain of bondage be broken. We declare, we announce, we yell from the hilltops that God is good and He sets us free and He's given us a path to run. Father, we just thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Would you go ahead and stand with me? Would you do that?